So good morning, everybody. We're the fifth and final week exploring the book of James, which, of course, was never a book at all. It was a pastoral letter from James the pastor to encourage Jews and Jewish converts. So chapter five has been allotted to me, and there are three themes, really, that I want us to focus on this morning. There are other bits in it, but unless you want to stay here till two o'clock, I fear we need to limit it to three themes this morning. Uh, We're going to be looking at poverty, patience, and prayer. Poverty is actually not our poverty, but it's our attitude to other people's poverty. So I want to begin by asking you, are you rich? One or two thinking, hmm, not sure where this is going. (laughs) According to the World Health Organization, if you have a roof over your head this coming week, you have enough money put by for your next bill and enough food in your cupboards for three days, then you are among the world's top third of the richest people. That suggests we are rich, whether we have thought so or not. And on that basis, maybe we need to listen to what James is saying when he's speaking to the rich. It comes with a warning. A warning about hoarding wealth and a warning about failing to pay proper wages to our workers. Let's look first at hoarding wealth. I'm sure we do our best to save for a rainy day. A little bit put by, just in case. It is prudent, it is sensible, it is wise. But how much do we hang on to for that little pot? There are millions of children worldwide, especially in the third world, who would just long for enough money to pay for them to go to school. They would gladly walk three, four, or five miles to school on an empty stomach, be there all day, and walk three or five miles back again, still on an empty stomach, in order to have the family meal at night, just so they could be at school. It would probably cost you or I, the various charities, probably something like £15 a month. Maybe you're saying, Pam, Can't do £15 a month. That's okay. Maybe as a family you could. Maybe with Christian friends you could get together and perhaps just sponsor one child. It's just a thought. How big need your rainy day pot be? Let's move on to failing to pay wages. You're probably thinking, Pam, I don't have any people who work on my land that I I oppress in any shape or form. Okay. I find this has challenged me perhaps more than anything else this morning. What about fair trade goods? Perhaps we do the tea and coffee thing. Perhaps fair trade bananas, maybe chocolate. But what about the other bits? There's so many more things we could do from the chewy bars, from dried fruit, preserves, dried cocoa, muesli, stationary products, chewy bars, and so much more. But it's so easy, isn't it, when we're going around the supermarket to just say, while I'm here, I'll just get a that and I'll get a that. And you do it in the one-stop shop and pay once at the end. It's so much easier than having to decide we'll set aside and buy some things from the fair trade store. I wonder if in this hot weather, lovely though it is, there have ever been moments when you've said, oh, I think I need to sit in the shade, have a cold drink, cool off a bit, (laughs) or perhaps go indoors just just for a while till it gets to perhaps half past two or three. But there are those out in the fields for maybe eight or ten hours at a time, in the scorching heat, day after day, with a bag packed on their back, and they're picking leaves that you and I have in our tea. They're picking the beans that you and I have in our coffee. They're picking the cotton that you and I have in our clothes. I just wonder whether there's any way in which we could do more. The way we spend our money, does it 
aggravate their poverty or does it alleviate it? Perhaps let's take this a little nearer home. The big issue sellers. Would we stand outside for eight hours at a time, no matter what the weather? We do usually have a variety here in England. Just in the hopes that one in a hundred people might smile and say, I'll buy one of your magazines so that they can have a few pence from each magazine. Would we do that? How demoralising is it for them when not only do we not buy one, but we walk past deep in conversation as though they're not even there. I feel challenged by this. And just maybe, <coughs> excuse me, just maybe James is addressing us after all. Hoarding wealth when we could spare a little, perhaps joining with others. Fair trade, giving a little more. The big issue seller, and so many more. What does the Bible say about poverty? John 3.16, of course, is the very heart of the gospel. God so loved the world that he gave. We have a giving God. You want to know what giving's like? Look at God. God gave his only son. And Jesus emptied himself of all but love and gave to the uttermost on the cross, dying and rising again. We cannot outgive God. 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. So remember the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. For though he was rich, all the glory of heaven, though for our sakes he became poor, that we through his poverty, nowhere to lay his head, remember, might become rich and gain all the gifts of heaven. 2 Corinthians 9 and 7 saying... Do not give reluctantly or under compulsion because God loves a cheerful giver. So don't go home today and say, oh, flipping neck. Pam's wanted to dig deeper into our pockets. Please, that's not what it's about. It's about wanting to give because God's love gives us the example and we want to pour out more giving. And of course, the Gospels remind us that hoarded wealth is subject to thieves, moths and rust. So, it's not very comfortable, but thank you, James, for this reminder of how we treat others, when perhaps we could have skimmed over it and thought, that doesn't apply to me, and neither does that. Let's move on to the second of our P. We've looked briefly at poverty. Let's have a look now, then, at patience. <coughs> Nearly 40 years ago, I was a new Christian. I'd gone to church on and off most of my life, but Jesus was somewhere out there, somewhere in here, but actually I was Lord of my life. But finally, 40 years ago, I became a new Christian. And I remember listening to a sermon on fruits of the Spirit. You know the list, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, etc. Patience, I thought, ah, that's me. And I found I needed to pray for patience. And my prayer went something like this. Lord, give me patience. I need patience, and I need it now. <laughs> Which sort of underlined <laughs> the need for patience. I've improved a little, <laughs> but I've still somewhere to go. Sorry, Lord, I really am working on it. Keep helping me. This morning, patience we're going to look at comes into three strands. The first is patience in suffering. The second is patience, waiting for the Lord's return. And the third is patience with others. We in the West demand things instantly. Now we'll do. Some 30 years ago, um, we bought our first computer. It was something like a little electron, big bulky thing, a bit like a big telly with a big thing at the back and the screen, it was all in black and white, of course, no colour, and it had a sort of tennis game on. So you could use little levers, and there was something a bit like a white bar that went up and down. You could move it up and down at that side and that side, so you could have two players. 
and there was a white sort of a ping pong ball that went in between. So you used your white lever, a bit like a tennis racket, to hit the ball and then it went that side. It sounds terribly basic, doesn't it? It was such fun when we first got it. Not only for our two girls who were junior age, but my husband and I as well. We loved it. But guess what? Computer technology has progressed in those 30 years more than we could ever imagine in our wildest dreams. Statistically, one in four of us abandon a website on the computer if it doesn't download within four seconds. Patience you're talking about, Dave? Four seconds. Electric lights come on in milliseconds. We order shopping online and it comes in a matter of hours. Society doesn't encourage us to be patient. And patience comes in different colours, different shades. You might think, depending on what your struggle is, <laughs> you might think of patience when you're driving along quite nicely and somebody comes tearing along and cuts right under you and you have to brake like mad just to avoid a collision. You maybe think, bless him. <laughs> Or her. Or it may be that you're an England football team supporter and you've been waiting 28 years for them to reach the semi-final. And they did. And maybe not got any further, but bless them. They've got that far and that's something. 28 years for a supporter. How's that for patience? Maybe if you're a young lad and you're trapped in an underground cave in Thailand, you need a different sort of patience when you're told those outside maybe can't get to you very quickly. And maybe you're wa watching the water level rise hour after hour after hour, and some of you can't swim, and none of you can dive. Different sort of patience again. Patience is a choice. We can shrug our shoulders and say, I'm just not the patient sort. Or we can work on it with God's help and make some measured progress. In verse 7, James tells of a farmer. My cousin is a farmer called John, and he has a farm just outside Hunmanby, a few miles away. And um, he has some crops on his farm. And he will be a bit anxious at the moment, because the dry, sunny weather is lovely for us, but it's not swelling the ears of corn on his grain as it should. That means the yield will be down. Less flour in each tiny grain. It means less money for him, less money for him to pay his workers. It means perhaps more expensive flour on our shelves if it's affecting our whole country. He has to be patient. Yes, he's got all the, the equipment, he's got a combine harvester that does everything magically and bales it and rolls it out absolutely ready bound, much easier than it was years ago for my grandfather. He has a dryer in case there's ever rain and the corn is slightly moist so that he can dry it so that it's fit, ready to go to the millers and be ground. But he can't do anything about the weather. He has to wait for the sun, wait for the rain, wait for the right time. And of course, sometimes, just a couple of weeks before the right time, the optimum moment, there comes a storm that lashes the corn, lays it flat, has it pulped in the wet mud and is useless in spite of the months of preparation. Patience. Let's be honest, it's easy to be patient when we're not under pressure. The farmer, relying on good equal balance of sun and rain, just has to wait and see, and finds it hard after months and months when the storm ruins the crop. Or, as happened about 20 years ago, I may be slightly wrong, but I think it's about that, when there's an outbreak of foot and mouth that meant the whole herd had to be killed. Different sort of patience. Early 1990s, a friend of mine heard of a, an organisation called Love Europe. 
some of you may have heard of it, may remember, and they were encouraging teenagers and uh, young 20-somethings who were passionate about Jesus to meet together, to be willing to go and learn a smattering of a language uh, of one of the European countries and go in twos to those countries to share something of their faith in, in very simple terms on the streets. My friend and someone with her was allotted the country Belgium. Two other girls they got to know while they were there were allocated Turkey. So they were sent to a particular place in Turkey where they were sharing their faith in very simple terms. But some there didn't like it. And day two, they were arrested and thrown into a Turkish prison. Their shoes were taken from them, their belt, their outer clothing, their rucksacks, all that they had was taken away and they were left for several hours. They had to dig deep into their faith, believing that somewhere among the patients was a trust that the Lord would help and somehow bring them through without knowing exactly how it would happen who were in the darker reaches of a Turkish cell where apparently no one spoke English. But still they hung on and they decided they would do exactly what Paul had done and they sang praises, sang hymns, sang spiritual songs and they prayed. They did it all that day. And finally, when it was nearly bedtime in the evening, they were brought some bread and water and their shoes. The following morning, and having woken at various times during the night, and they sung and they prayed during the night, the following morning continued to sing and pray their praises. And then they were brought some bread and some water and some cheese and some meat. Carried on, and a bit later, by the evening, they were brought similar food again, and they were brought their outer garments this time, and the belts were returned. Again, the following night, whenever they woke, they sang and praised God. And the following morning, without any explanation, they were brought all their effects, the rucksacks, and were allowed to leave. Patience, even when everything's falling apart. Because that's also the sort of patience that James is talking about. How are we with patience when everything starts to fall about? Do we decide that God isn't going to help? Turn our backs on God? Do we resort to our own strength? Do we feel God has let us down because God didn't do something just the minute we wanted? James reminds us of Job who lost everything. There was no light at the end of the tunnel for Job. Just one thing after another was taken from him. It seemed absolutely hopeless. But Job held on, even while the circumstances suggested otherwise. And God was faithful and rewarded him abundantly. It's worth holding on to God, even when everything is falling apart and God will hold on to you. So patience when we're struggling. Let's move on to patience when waiting for the Lord's return. I've discovered that my sense of timing isn't quite the same as the Lord's. The early church was expecting the Lord to return at any moment. And James here is encouraging the people to be patient. James, we believe, the writer, we, we're fairly convinced he was the brother of Jesus, who'd gone most of the time up to uh, AD 33 when Jesus died on a cross, just not believing, thinking his brother had got it seriously wrong, that there's something wrong with Jesus, thinking it couldn't, it couldn't really be right, and then he rose from the dead. And Jesus, James did an about turn and became one of the most ardent supporters of Jesus. So AD 40, when this book this letter that James wrote was written, is only about seven years after the death and resurrection of Jesus. And James is saying, be patient. Be patient. Paul, writing to the Thessalonian church, 20 years later, round about AD 60, says the same thing. Be patient. He hasn't come yet, but he will be patient. We don't know when. It's only God who knows when the time is right. Might come just like a thief in the night. 
Not sure about that analogy, really, but anyway, there we go. Um, we're still waiting. And Jesus hasn't shown up in, in physical, bodily form. But he will. He will. It might be in the year 3000. It might be this Christmas. It might be before the end of my sermon. If you're not very happy, you might be hoping it will come before the end of my sermon. You don't have to listen to it all. But be patient. The Lord will return. We have a God who keeps his promises. Patience with others. Verse 9. James exhorts us not to grumble at others or about others, not to undermine others, what they're saying or doing. Do we sometimes have a bit of a, a mumble about worship? Oh, I didn't really say that, did I? You know, it's maybe not your favourite hymn or your music, or you weren't sure about the prayers, or you're not keen on the person at the front. Sorry, I won't be here for long. Do you know, do we ever do that? Do we ever think, well, I wish they'd some, or they could have done this, or... I wonder if we sometimes forget that worship isn't isn't about us enjoying ourselves. Not that we're meant to be miserable, but worship is all about God and what we bring for God. So maybe it isn't your favourite piece of music in here, but find the words in them and say, Lord, that's what I believe about you. Thank you for being that God. So maybe somewhere in that. There may never be a grumble here. I'm sure you're absolutely thrilled with everything that goes on here. But just in case, I just thought I'd mention that. We also need to be patient with others who are having a difficult time. Job's friends, Job's comforters, the sort of friends you never want. They weren't the sort of friends we'd choose to have in time of difficulty. They irked him. They berated him for his lack of faith, for his unconfessed sin. They just misunderstood him. But God understood Job. And he loved him. And God would have the last word. In spite of the friends, God saw exactly what Job would need, never left him alone, and gave him abundantly when he came through his dark patch. We saw the same with Jesus, the patience that Jesus had. People like Nicodemus, the religious leader who should have got it sussed, seemed to be a bit slow on the uptake. How can I be born again, he said, at my age, the size I am. Oh, Jesus was so patient with him. He was patient with the Syrophoenician woman who wouldn't be quiet and wouldn't be sent away because she wanted her daughter to be healed. And Jesus eventually so impressed did heal her daughter at a distance. Jesus was patient again uh, with the, the woman at the well, answering her questions, getting into a, quite a deep dialogue with her helping her rediscover the hope she'd lost. Patient with Zacchaeus, the man who wanted to hide in the tree, the nasty little squirt that nobody else wanted anything to do with. Jesus said, I'm going to not only talk to you, now, I'm going to come to your house for tea. We can talk about this some more. The patience that Jesus had. We need to be patient with our listening ear, with our care for one another. We are not only to believe in Jesus, this sort of underpins everything James is saying, we are to copy him, we are to be like him, do the things he does, be the sort of person he is. That's our challenge, that's what James is trying to say. Poverty, patience, prayer, got up to verse 13 now. James is reminding his readers of the importance of prayer. We're reminded that James isn't just advocating good deeds rather than faith, but rather our faith in Jesus Christ should be borne out by the way we live our lives and the things we do. By doing what Jesus did. It used to be an expression that said we walk the talk. 
It's no good my standing here at the front and suggesting you do this, that and the other if I don't do anything else about it. For instance, if I carry on buying whatever I want from the supermarket shelves and I don't buy the cocoa or the muesli or the chewy bars or, or anything else out there, if I don't support children who need to go to school, if I don't buy a big issue from the big issue seller, I need to walk the talk. We all do. Seems to me that James is saying we need to pray in all circumstances. It was Paul who said that, but reading between the lines, it seems that James is saying if you're full of joy, then praise God. And we praise God through prayer, sometimes through singing, prayer, set to music. It's fine. Are you full of problems? Have you got a lot on your plate right now? Then pray. Yes, for yourself. Some people believe they shouldn't pray for themselves. But yes, if you need help, you pray for yourself. But please do it honestly. Take off the mask that sometimes we wear. When we say, yes, I'm fine, thank you. Be honest with God. God knows us just the way we are. We don't need to pretend with God. Ask. If necessary, ask others to pray with you. Confide in them. Ask them to support you in prayer. Are you sick? Ask church leaders to pray for you. If necessary, using oil. You're needing forgiveness? Again, pray, being honest with God and perhaps with Christian friends who will support you and help you. Sometimes we have to admit we don't get it right. Let somebody down. Say something, blurt something out we shouldn't have done. We need forgiveness. Come in prayer. Falling away. Strange expression, really, isn't it? It doesn't mean you fall on your knees. Rather, it means that other things come and crowd out our awareness of God. It happens so easily, doesn't it? Other things come along. You know, by all means, come to the evening service. But golly, make sure that the cup final is finished before, because otherwise you'll still be watching the telly. Or perhaps, well, I missed last Sunday. And, well, it won't really matter if I miss this Sunday at church as well. Or maybe, you know, after a few Sundays where you've missed, you actually don't feel that much different whether you go or you don't. It's so easy to slip, slide away. And God just wants to bring us back. If we can help somebody to come back, Help somebody who needs that help, that encouragement, that support. That is wonderful. Years ago, um, our youngest was taking swimming lessons. And um, she wasn't the most confident in the water. And one by one, they'd all done the width, which is really good. And then one by one, they all were encouraged to jump in at the deep end and swim to the shallow end and do a length. And eventually, they'd all done it, except our daughter. She'd get so far, <laughs> doing her best, and eventually she would start to go under the water and the teacher with the pole would then bring her to the side. And this happened two or three weeks, and this was the last week of the term. And in the end, the teacher came to me and said, Mum, would you walk beside her and encourage her? So I said, yes, OK. So I was, I was doing that. Yes, come on, you're doing really well. You're more than half. Try not to give up now. Yes, take bigger, bigger stroke. Keep going. You're wonderful. You're three quarters there. Don't give up now. You're nearly there. And, and finally she made it. And the place erupted in clapping and cheering. Do you know what? It seems to me that's what heaven does. When there's a new person comes to Christ or someone's been falling away, backsliding, and we help them come back. The angels are cheering. They're thrilled because that's what they care about most. Prayer. James reminds us about Elijah praying for drought. We've been at it again, Elijah. <laughs> and it came. And then he prayed for rain, and it came. Elijah was a great prayer warrior, but as we remember, just an ordinary man, an ordinary human being, just as we are. We have some great prayers here at Burniston, but we aren't supposed to sit back and leave prayer to a handful of people and limit our prayers to just a couple of sentences about ourselves. 
I'd like to tell you exactly how prayer works when we offer prayers to God, but I can't. I know only that we have a loving God who delights in our sharing our lives with him through prayer. Of course, it's not always straightforward. Last month, I felt God's nudge to pray for two people who had serious back pain um, at two different churches, two different occasions. I felt this nudge and felt I had to obey. So with permission, I prayed with my hand on the back of each one. One was healed uh, clearly and quickly. The other one wasn't apparently healed. I don't know why. One was, and one apparently wasn't. I just had the nudge to pray for them, and I had to have the courage and the obedience to say, yes, Lord, I'll do this, even if I end up looking silly, because it hasn't happened. I know you've nudged me, and I must be obedient, and I must pray, and I did. The rest we have to leave up to God. We've got to let God be God. So, let us continue to pray in simplicity, in total honesty, not with a mask on. Don't feel you have to use some of the words that are used here at the front or that you find in a book. If you want to do, that's fine. If that's you, don't feel you have to. Pray as you can, in the way you can. Don't pray as you can't. That doesn't work for you. At the end of this morning's worship, there will be uh, some prayer moments that are coming up this week connected with Burniston that may be of interest to you. So before you all dash off for your cars or have your conversation, just see if there's anything on the screen right at the end after the blessing that might be helpful to you. Because perhaps like me, you'll find you pray better with someone else to support you and guide you and encourage you and keep you going. So just to recap this last chapter of James, poverty. Are our finances aggravating or alleviating the poverty of others? Patience. Hang on to God even when everything is falling apart. God will not let us down. Patience. Keep on expecting our Lord to return. And the third, patience. Patience with others without grumbling. Supporting others. Helping others return to the Lord. Seeking forgiveness when needed. Prayer in all circumstances. I'd like to end with a sheet that I came across by chance the other day among lots of bits of paper of resources. I cannot say who the author is. I have no idea. I was given it as a photocopy from a book some years ago. All I know is that it was um, published by the Longman Group, which could be Dartman, Longman and Todd, uh, in 1995, but some of the words absolutely hit home to me. I found it such a challenge, and I just wonder if you would too, so I'd like to share it with you. The writer, whoever it was, said, My challenge to you is to seek to have a closer relationship with our Lord. Study the Bible, pray more, and give ourselves for his service then as Christians, we can echo this in our hearts, and this is the real challenge. My face is set, my walk is sure, my goal is heaven, my road is narrow, my way is rough, my friends are few, my guide is reliable, and my mission is clear. I cannot be bought, compromised, detoured, lured away. I cannot be turned back, deluded or delayed. I will not flinch in the face of adversity, negotiate at the table of the enemy, ponder at the pool of popularity, meander in the maze of mediocrity. I won't give up, shut up, let up, or slow up until I have stayed up, stored up, prayed up, paid up, and spoken up for the cause of Christ. I am a disciple of Jesus. 
I must go till he comes, give till I drop, preach till all know, and work till he stops me. And when he does return, hopefully he will have no problem recognising me. It might even have been James's challenge to us. In Christ's name, amen. <laughs>